Tonight I'm continuing this series of messages on the revelatory ministry of the miracles of Jesus. We're going to be considering the healing of the gathering demoniac tonight. A miracle is given considerable attention in Scripture. I want to make an observation about Christ's miracles before I begin. And that is that they confirm the presence of adversarial personalities. Mm -hmm. unseen adversarial personalities. The uh, domain in which we are working out our salvation of fear and trembling is occupied by a great host of both evil and good personalities. An innumerable company of angels are operating behind the scenes, ministering for those who are heirs of salvation. There is also a great army of spiritual forces of wickedness, referred to as principalities and powers, and the rulers of the darkness of this world and spiritual wickedness in high places. And there are demons, and they are all behind the scenes. There's a tremendous warfare going on. A lot of influence, and man of himself is impotent in this arena. I think people that champion such things as free will and discipline, self-discipline and things like this, they are just completely oblivious of the fact that humanity occupies a domain that in which all the other personalities are vastly superior to them. Uh -huh. The only superiority you have is in Christ. And if, if you're not walking in fellowship with Christ, you have absolutely no superiority at all in this domain. Uh -huh. you, are a, you are a total victim. And so we're seeing this in some of these, some of these miracles. We'll see this in this man tonight. This man was utterly impotent in this, under this circumstance. There wasn't a thing he could do about it, nor could anyone else do anything about it. The fact that we may not, so far as our own discernment is concerned, which is subject to question, the fact that we may not see things like this on every hand does not mean that Satan has diminished his effort. It might also mean that we're kind of blind to what's going on. Maybe we, maybe Satan has taught us to call things by other names so that men have explanations for things like a gathering demoniac today. Huh? May this happen today. He could be expressed. Psychiatrist could explain it all to us. <laughs> well, the scripture is going to explain it to us. When the human personality breaks down and is dominated by something else, you can't call it addiction. This is just not the kind of world we're in. Men are not overcome by habits. And they're not victorious because of habits. It's this vast world of personalities. We're going to be introduced to them. Introduced to them tonight. Now, as is a custom in most of these miracles, Matthew. Mark and Luke give the account, and I'm going to take the time to read it because then I'm going to deal with the various details of it, try and put them in sort of a chronological order. Matthew, the 8th chapter, begin at verse 28 through 34. Jesus has just crossed over the sea of Galilee, and when he was come to the other side, into the country of the Gergesenes, there met him two possessed with devils coming out of the tombs, exceeding fierce, so that no man might pass that way. And behold, they cried out, saying, What have we to do with thee, Jesus, thou Son of God? Art thou come hither to torment us before the time? And there was a good way off from them, a good way off from them, and heard of many swine feeding. So the devils besought him, saying, If thou cast us out, suffer us to go away into the herd of swine. And he said unto them, Go. And when they were come out of the men, they went into the herd of swine. And behold, the whole herd of swine ran violently down a steep place into the sea, and they perished in the waters. And they that kept them fled, and went their ways into the city, and told everything 
what was befallen to the possessed of the devils. And behold, the whole city came out to meet Jesus, and when they saw him, they besought him that he would depart out of their coast. <coughs> Mark, he gives a, an even more lengthy account here. Mark 5th chapter, the first 20 verses. <coughs> And they came over into the other side of the sea, into the country of the Gadarenes. And when he was come out of the ship, immediately, there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit, who had his dwelling among the tombs, and no man could bind him, no, not with chains. Because that he had been often bound with fetters and chains, and the chains had been plucked asunder by him, and the fetters broken in pieces, neither could any man tame him. And always, night and day, he was in the mountains and in the tombs, crying and cutting himself with stones. And when he saw Jesus afar off, he ran and worshipped him, and cried with a loud voice, saying, What have I to do with thee, Jesus? Thou Son of the Most High God, I adjure thee by God that thou torment me not. For... He had said unto him, Jesus had said unto him, Come out of the man, thou unclean spirit. And he asked him, What is thy name? And he answered, saying, My name is Legion, for we are many. And he besought him much that he would not send them away out of the country. Now there was nigh unto the mountains a great herd of swine feeding, and all the devils besought him, saying, Send us into the swine, that we may enter into them. And forthwith Jesus gave them leave, and the unclean spirits went out and entered into the swine, and the herd ran violently down a steep place into the sea. They were about 2,000, and were choked in the sea. And they that fed the swine fled and told it in the city and in the country, and they went out to see what it was that had been done. And they come to Jesus and see him that was possessed with the devil and had a legion sitting and clothed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. And they that saw it told them how it befell him that was possessed with the devils and also concerning the swine. And they began to pray him to depart out of their coast. And when he was come into the ship, he that had been possessed with the devil prayed him that he might be with him. Howbeit Jesus suffered him not, but saith unto him, Go home to thy friends, tell them how great things the Lord hath done unto thee, and hath had compassion on thee. And he departed and began to publish in Decapolis how great things Jesus had done for him, and all men did marvel. And then Jesus passed over to the other side by ship. Then in Luke, the 8th chapter, in the 26th verse, this account. And they arrived at the country of the Gadarenes, which is over against Galilee. He's on the other, other side of the sea. And when he was went forth to the land, they met him out of the city... They met him out of the city, a certain man which had devils long time, and wear no clothes, neither abode in any house but in the tombs. When he saw Jesus, he cried out and fell down before him, and with a loud voice said, What have I to do with thee, Jesus, thou Son of God, most high? I beseech thee, torment me not. For he had commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man. For oft times it had caught him. For oft times it had caught him. And he was kept bound with chains and fetters, and he broke the bands and was driven of the devil into the wilderness. And Jesus asked him, saying, What is thy name? He said, Legion. Because many devils were entered into him. And they besought him that he would not command them to go out into the deep. And there was there a herd of many swine feeding on the mountain, and they besought him that he would suffer them to enter into them, and he suffered them. 
Then went the devils out of the man. Then went the de then went the devils out of the man, and entered into the swine. And the herd ran violently down a steep place into the lake and were choked. And when they that fed them saw what was done, they fled and went and told it in the city and in the country. Then they went out to see what was done and came to Jesus and found the man out of whom the devils were departed, sitting at the feet of Jesus, sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed and in his right mind. And they were afraid. They also, which saw it, told them by what means he had that was possessed of the devils was healed. Then the whole multitude of the country of the Gadarenes round about besought him to depart from them, for they were taken with great fear. And he went up into the ship and returned back again. Now the man out of whom the devils were departed besought him that he might be with him, but Jesus sent him away, saying, Return to thy own house. And show how great things God has done unto thee. And he went his way and published throughout the whole city how great things Jesus had done unto him. And then Jesus returned to the other to the other side. Quite a quite an intriguing account. <clears throat> the place this occurred is referred to in two different ways. One Matthew refers to it as the country of the Gergesenes. Mark and Luke call it the country of the Gadarenes. Both of them are the same. One refers to like a region, and the other to the people, Gergesenes, who lived in the region. So we might say the USA or, or America, or then the Americas, so which is where the Americans live. So they, it's both the same, same country. It was across the Lake of Galilee. The Lake of Galilee was approximately 16 miles long and 6 miles wide. Pretty good sized body of water. It's also called the Lake of Gennesaret and several other names in Scripture. It's a significant lake in the Gospel accounts. Matthew says there were two men. Mark and Luke says there was one. So there's not the, we're not dealing with technicalities here. One of these men apparently was the prominent man, and that's how the other Gospel writers focus on the more prominent apparently of the two. Matthew says he was possessed with demons. Their name was Legion. A Legion was Roman group of about 6,000. We don't know if that's how many were there, but it's very many, very many demons were in this man. So Matthew says he is possessed with demons. Matthew also says he came out of the tombs, a graveyard, we call it graveyard. That's where he lived. Matthew says he was exceeding fierce, like a madman. Couldn't get near this man. And as a matter of fact, Matthew says no one passed by this way. So he kind of veered away from this, from this part where Jesus went. <laughs> this right where Jesus went, where nobody else wanted to pass by. And he had a... Matthew says he had an unclean spirit. So he defines the demons a little further, an unclean spirit. And no man could bind them, so they tried. They tried to subdue this fellow, and, and no number of people could do it. They couldn't do it. With chains. They bound him with chains. He just snap them asunder. Just chains. And in those days, chains weren't like the kind around your neck. I mean, these were, <laughs> these were made to hold people. Now they couldn't hold him. No man could bind him. To say nothing of not being able to heal him. Scriptures also tell us that he was in the mountains. It was a mountainous region. And that he was in the tombs and he was crying out, shouting out, shrieking out at night and cutting himself. Just a kind of a wild... The devil doesn't treat people good, just in case you didn't know. Sure. Now, there's people that worship Satan and we have some familiarity with this in our family. They teach that Satan is good to his people. He's not good to people. Here's an example right. of what Satan does to people. He's not good to them at all. Luke 8, 27 says he came out of the city. That is, he was formerly a city dweller. This man used to live in the city. He went and looked on the surface like he went berserk, and he went out and had to drive him out and keep him out of the tombs. He's just such a dangerous, such a dangerous man. Luke 8, 27 said he'd had these demons for a long time. How long? We don't know. It was a long time. He'd been in this state. This wasn't like a, 
instant thing that happened. A long time. And Luke also has, he had no clothes. He was stark naked. That's how he was. Luke 8, 29 says this evil spirit would catch him. That's just kind of a startling-like word. He'd just catch him. Man was powerless to do anything about it. He was like that man that met the disciples of Jesus at the foot of the Mount of Transfiguration. He had his son with him. He said he had a demon who would throw his son in the fire and throw him in the water, and he didn't know when he was going to do it. They couldn't stop him from doing it. <laughs> well, if you ever think, if you ever kind of think that you can manage your own life, you better be thinking again. If you haven't been in this situation, the only reason you haven't been in this situation is Christ has withheld it from Amen. Man. That's the only reason you're in this situation. Even people who aren't in Christ, the only reason they're not in this condition all the time is because Jesus has the power over these spirits. Or the whole world will be doing this all the time. Amen. The old theologians used to call this prevenient grace. That's back when people were a little more thoughtful than they are today. Prevenient grace meant that God kept people from being utterly destroyed by the devil before they were saved, that they never would have been saved. <laughs> never could have been. One time Paul said that he'd been protected by God to this hour. So he knew it. He knew before he was in Christ that God, through his great power, had subdued the devil. And Luke 8.30 says that sometimes he would drive the man into the wilderness. Just, just go shrieking and cutting himself and running into the barren places. There's something about Satan that you want to pick up on when you read things like this. This vivid account of this victim here is that he likes desolate places where dead are. I mean, this is... If you think it's coincidence that we're living at a time when there's a lot of skulls and a lot of dead things and uh, musical groups like the living dead, if you want to know what all that stuff's about, that tells you Satan is dominating this generation. Uh -huh, uh -huh. That's why this stuff is happening. Satan capitalizes on death. Jesus capitalizes on life. Amen. And wherever there's undue attention, we've got suicide raging out of control among the younger generation. Here not long ago, a group of kids sat on a railroad track here in this city, sat on a railroad track and let the train run them over, made a pact. Why? Why is that? They were driven to the tracks. That's what happened. This is what Satan does to his people. So if, you, if anyone ever is tempted to toy around with life and to put off living for Christ. If you're ever tempted to do that, boy, oh, let me tell you, you are in dangerous territory. You've got an account here of what the devil does to people. Uh -huh. And it's just quite remarkable. Now when Jesus landed on the shore and he left, you remember a thriving ministry, and he came to this shore, this, this demon had harassed this man, these demons had harassed this man, but they did they didn't harass Jesus. They didn't do anything to him. All they could do is talk. That's all they could do is talk, and they're like they were pleading. There are at least two things, at least three things they pled here. One is, don't torment us, don't torment us. Another one says, one got the word, they said, don't make us go into the deep. I'm not sure whether that was the deep lake where they ended up anyway. Or whether that was the abyss of like hell. I'm not sure exactly what it was, but they asked him, don't cast us into the deep. And then another time they said, they said, let us go into the swine over there, which were unclean animals. Of course an unclean spirit would want to go to unclean animal. And so they, they asked Jesus things. <laughs> they didn't fight him. They didn't resist him. They didn't present some argument against him. They didn't try to defend what they were or why they were that way. They were like pleading. They knew who this was. Uh -huh. So if you find people don't submit to Jesus, it doesn't make any difference what they say. They just don't know who he is. That's right. That's all. They, if they're delaying, and they say, well, I'm, I'm thinking about it. See, they're lying about it. They're not thinking about it either. They're lying about that. They lie. They're not thinking about it. They're not thinking about it. That's why. Because when you know Jesus and think about it, even if you're a demon, you ask Jesus to do for some favor. That's the way Jesus is. Well, this demon cried out, ran, and worshipped him. How's that? So here he comes, leaping out of the tombs, running toward the seashore. 
Someone who's familiar with that region said, oh, ho, ho, we told you not to come by this way. We told you, here he comes. And he falls down and worships the Lord Jesus. And Jesus just says, this is the word, come out. Come out of the man. Then a dialogue follows this when he said, come out. First the demon said, don't, uh, don't torment us. Interesting, isn't it? They didn't think anything at all about tormenting this man. It's uh -huh. just, kind of just kind of an interesting thing. They didn't think anything at all about tormenting this man, but they didn't want to be tormented. Mm -hmm. Satan doesn't either. Satan and his hosts don't want to be tormented, but they are going to be. Mm -hmm. You may rest assured, don't, don't torment us. Please, please, Jesus, don't torment us. <clears throat> Matthew 8, 29 says, Are you come to torment us before the time? See, they know. Satan and his hosts know where they're going to end up. Mm -hmm. In fact, it says of Satan, he knows the time short. In Revelation, the 12th chapter. Demon, see, the only ignorant people in all the world, vast world of personalities, unseen and seen, in heaven, in hell, and on the earth, the only personalities that are uninformed are humans. Everybody else knows what's going on. That's right. Amen. Satan knows what's going on. Demons know what's going on. Evil spirits know what's going on. Holy angels know what's going on. Four living creatures know. Twenty-four elders know. Cherubim and seraphim know. Only people who are the only ones made in God's image. Doesn't it strike you as rather peculiar? That the only personalities in all the creation that have been made in the image of God are the only ones that really, of themselves, though really they don't know what's going on. My, right, what a situation. Don't, don't torment us. Luke, uh, Luke says, I beseech thee. <laughs> so it's like over and over. Torment me not. Mark 5, 7 said, that man said, I adjure thee by God. <laughs> How about that? How about that? I adjure thee by God. Torment me not. And what did Jesus reply? Jesus said, what's your name? <laughs> uh, this would have kind of rattled anybody else but the Lord Jesus. But this didn't rattle him at all. What's your name? Do you think Jesus maybe didn't know his name? Oh, no. Jesus' disciples are with him. And this thing's going to be reported and it's going to fill what's called the Decapolis, which is a cluster a region of ten cities. So decapolis means ten cities. So it was a cluster of ten cities. These cities were approximately seven miles south of Bethsaida, where Jesus was going to go later. It was a region dominated by Satan. The region where he could do no mighty work because of their unbelief. He did more work among the tombs than he did in the synagogues. <laughs> Don't that strike you as rather peculiar? That when he went into the Jewish territory, into the synagogues, he had to take a man out of the city and away from the synagogue to do something. But here he comes into the tombs where someone's dominated by Satan and he has no difficulty at all. Why is that? Well, it's because religious sin is the worst of all sin. People who think that they're Christian but aren't, they're the worst of all people. And the God stymies the hand of God. What is your name? Well, they told our name's Legion because we're many, so there's a lot of us. Well, the thought occurred to me, and this is not the first time it's occurred to me, but it's an intriguing thought. If this many demons up to somewhere up to 6,000, if this many demons could inhabit and influence a person, how much Holy Spirit do you think can be in a person? Amen. Amen. You think God can be outdone by the devil? Do you think there actually could be more of the devil in a person than there is of God? Man was made in the image of God, not in the image of Satan. Man wasn't made in the image of Satan. He was made in the image of God. Do you, you think that there's less capacity for God than there is for Satan? Well, of course there's not. This is a challenging consideration to say, Lord, not only do I not want 
to be dominated by the devil, I do want to be dominated by the Spirit. Amen. And you, you just as well go and talk to this man about free will as to someone who says we're under control by the Spirit. You mean, do you mean to tell me that a human personality can be dominated by the devil and not dominated by God? I mean, you have to really be stupid to assume such a thing. This can't be. If man can be dominated by anybody, he can surely be dominated by God. Amen. As a matter of fact, the scriptures speak about the mind controlled by the spirit. This man was controlled by an evil spirit. I'm showing you here the dialogue between these demons and Christ. They had a dialogue on the shore there, a conversation. So he asked him what their name was, and they asked him if they could enter into these swine. Matthew said, there was a good way off from them, a herd of swine, a herd of many swine feeding. So the devil besought him, saying, If thou cast us out, if he actually didn't want to be cast out, but if you cast us out, let me read between the lines. We know we can't do anything about it. If you tell us to go, we, we're going to go. I mean, we can't resist it. So if thou cast us out, suffer us to go away into that, into the herd of swine down there. Mark 5. 11 says, There were nigh unto the mountains a great herd of swine feeding, and all the devils, so they all kind of spoke in unison, like, all the devils besought him, saying, Send us into the swine that we may enter into them. Luke said, And there was a herd of many swine feeding on the mountain, and they besought him that he would suffer them to enter into them. Why? Why do you suppose these demons wanted to enter those swine? It appears as though, and I'm just conjecturing at this point, there's a pure opinion. But it appears as though there is no, that these spirits do not want to be without some kind of body or framework. They want to be in something to exercise, in somebody. Now see, this compounds our situation. To be in an environment where there's a lot of wicked spirits, that's one thing. But to, for these spirits to want to be in somebody, that's, that's something else now, see? That greatly compounds the situation because these spirits are infinitely more powerful than human spirits. One demon could do a lot of damage to say nothing of a few thousand of them entering in. There was one lady in scripture named Mary Magdalene out of whom Jesus cast seven demons. There were seven in her. My God. See what sin did to people? Sin opened the door for Satan. Uh-huh. To open the door for Satan to enter in. Quite a dilemma. This is a hope. This is a hopeless dilemma. If you take Jesus out of the equation, this is a hopeless condition. There isn't anybody who can change this anymore. And they could tame that man in the tombs. They couldn't. Thank God that there's an exalted Savior. Well, the miracle. There's not a lot of details about the miracle itself. All the Scripture tells us is that they, the demons left. They left the man and went into the swine. But as soon as they left, this man, <laughs> this man wasn't wild anymore. He knew he had to get some clothes on right away. He was in his right mind. As soon as they left, so the miracle was that they left. They entered into these, entered into these swine. So their subjection, as you see, was to Christ is very apparent. They ask. They didn't say, well, "We're going to go over there." Because, see, Satan can't lift his little finger without asking. He really can't. Jesus is King of kings and Lord of lords, including the devil. Amen. He is. Matthew says that Jesus just said, go. Just one word, go. Mark said Jesus gave them leave. We'd say permission. Luke 8, 32 says he suffered them or he allowed them. Okay, go ahead. Do you notice they didn't ask to enter in some other man? Did you notice that? Seems to me they sensed that when Jesus was over there, Jesus doesn't cast the devil out of one man to enter in another man. <laughs> this, is, this isn't Jesus. This isn't how he works. And even the devil seems to know this. Well, what were the results of this, of this event? Well, <laughs> the swine, they went crazy too. When these were in the man, he was like a wild man, shrieking, cutting himself, crying, breaking chains, 
running up into the mountains, running out into the wilderness. So what do pigs do when they have something like this? They just ran down this steep slope, ran into the sea and drowned. How's that? Even pigs can't contain the devil. <laughs> huh? There was a, some years back when there was a famous child evangelist in the United States, he was noted for casting demons out of dogs and things like this, and they'd bring their dogs and they'd cast, oh yeah, this is the truth, they'd cast demons out of the dogs. Even wild animals won't let the devil work in them. Here's an example, right here, swine, they ran down. Now, this happened there, there were, these swine weren't just out there by themselves, they were some pig keepers. They're watching these swine, taking care of them for the owners. They saw all this happen. <laughs> now, I'm not, they were, one text says they were a great way off from the area where the wild man was, so, but they apparently were well, well aware of him being there. That's probably why they had the swine off a little way away. And they saw what happened, and, and so they left and told everybody about it. <laughs> quite, <laughs> quite a thing. Uh, they told, they went out and told it in the city and in the country, what the writer said. And they told him what had happened to the swine and what happened to this man. And the result was that the whole city came out to see. Like that whole city came out with that woman from the well when she bore witness. This whole city, see back in those days, people were more conscious of great things than they are in our time. Uh huh. See, in our time, you probably couldn't get this. You probably couldn't get the whole city to come out. Yeah. In our time, there's been such a blanket of indifference and dullness cast upon the people that it's just hard to awaken anybody to anything. But they all went out to see what had happened and uh, and to see Jesus. And when they got there, they saw this man. And he was sitting, one gospel writer said he's sitting at the feet of Jesus, which means there was some dialogue going on. And he also he was clothed, and he had a right mind. He was very lucid in his thoughts. And he wasn't wild any, anymore. Luke 8, 35 said, They came to Jesus and found the man out of whom the devils was departed, sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed in his right mind, and they were afraid. They knew. This is no ordinary power that did this. They were afraid. I've thought if it might not be appropriate in our time for God to work a work and make people scared. I've, I've thought about this. And uh, I'm still thinking about it. I don't, <laughs> I don't have a preference in this at this point, but I've pondered this, that God can work so he can make even Gadarenes afraid. Luke 8, 36 said, They also which saw it, that's the keepers of the swine, told them by what means he that was possessed of the devil was healed. So they, told, they, they opened up what had really happened. That there had been, been a dialogue between this man and Jesus. It, it sounded like the man was saying this. Actually, it was the demons. Saying, Don't torment us before the time. What's your name? Legion. Let us go into those swine. See, they, they told him how this happened. And as soon as these demons left him, this, this fellow was all right. He was all right as soon as it left. So they explained it all to them. And you wonder, well, that certainly ought to clear it up for the people. They must, maybe they'll, maybe they'll do like some people did when Jesus preached and bring their sick all out. Maybe that's what they'll do. No, they, uh, that's not what they did. In fact, they asked Jesus to leave. Uh-huh. Kind of he threatened the swine population. And he wanted to leave. Don't stay here. Now you know why those demons said to Jesus, don't make us leave this country. This region here. We got a little more, we're able to work a little more freely uh -huh. in this region. Maybe you've been in a region like that. There's certain regions that it's a very apparent Satan can work more easily in. He can, he can actually get more work done and uh, hook people more readily. 
You go like into Las Vegas, it's one of those regions. New York City is like one of those regions. Los Angeles, one of those regions. People like this, regions like this. That the Satan doesn't want to leave the region because he has a little wider range of influence. But Jesus said, so Jesus let him stay in the region. How's <laughs> that? Like it was there, they given over. Satan said, these are my kingdoms. Well, they're in this one of his kingdoms here. And so uh, when they asked Jesus to leave, he, he did. He didn't say, but well, you need me. There's many people that need me. I must go into the synagogues of the region. No, he just, he just left. He departed. What a, what a situation. Matthew 8 says, the whole city came out to meet Jesus, and when they saw him, they besought him that he would depart out of their coast. Not just, don't just leave this area, leave our whole region. Don't be here. Mark 5, 17 said they began to pray him to depart out of their coasts. Luke says the whole multitude of the country, the gatherings round about, besought him to depart from them. For they were, and Luke tells you why, they were taken with great fear. Colon. Same sentence. And he went up into the ship and returned back again. So he just <laughs> forthwith, forthwith left. And then the man published to be the man wanted to go with Jesus. When he, Jesus came to the ship, Mark says, he that was possessed with the devil prayed that he might be with him. I guess so. I guess so. I'd be with him. And he prayed him. He presented the case. Let me let me go with you. But Jesus didn't allow it. No. I want you to go home to your friends. Notice what he says here. Go home to your friends. People that know you, they knew what they knew what you were. Go home to them. Tell them how great things the Lord has done for thee and had compassion on me. The devil sure didn't have compassion on him, did he? Amen. You'll go tell him. Tell him what great compassion he's had on you. Luke said, Luke 8, 38, The man out of whom the devils were departed besought him that he might be with him, and Jesus sent him away, saying, Return to thy own house, show how great things God has done unto thee. And then he has, and he, he went his way and published throughout the whole city how great things Jesus had done unto him. Well, there's the, there's the account, quite a quiet account. What's some observations we can uh, see in, these, in this account? <clears throat> well, first of all, we occupy an intelligent battleground. Mm -hmm. This is, we're not occupying a battleground of wild personalities. This is intelligent. Uh -huh. Legions that come to torment us before the time. Yes. Please, please don't torment us. Send us into the swine. Uh -huh. Don't make us leave the coast. This is intelligent. We're in an yes. intelligent arena. Yes. That's why it's so wrong to adopt a religion that puts your mind to sleep. That's Amen. why it's so wrong. Amen. You're in a teeming world of personalities where demons and everybody are conversant. They're, they're intelligent. They know who Jesus is. They know what to ask Jesus. They, play, they know how to plead with Jesus. See, they Amen. know how to do this. And For you to adopt a religion that sends your mind off to park someplace this is not, this disarms you. That's right, amen. So we're an intelligent battleground. <clears throat> also learn from this, there are conditions for which men have no remedy. They just don't have any remedy for it at all. You may go to a counselor, you may go to a doctor, you may go to a preacher, you may go, it just doesn't anything anybody can do about it. That's all there is to it. They can't. And sometimes the Lord has to work with people for quite a while before they come to this conclusion. See? That there are things you can't do anything about. We also learn that men can be dominated by evil spirits. And that if you're not with Jesus, you're like open season. You don't have any guarantee that you won't be like this wild man. Now someone may say, well, drugs made him do it, or such and such made him do it. Or... See, the truth of the matter is there are personalities that can dominate you. There are. And you are no match. You are no match for them. <laughs> None at all. For the for the begin with, these are spirits that have been around for millennia, for thousands of years. And they are exceeding crafty. They're like snakes. 
They're extremely crafty, and it appears as though they are very aware of a lot of our weaknesses, that they know about them, the open doors that they can get into. So men can be dominated by evil spirits. We also learn that men are more valuable than animals. These swine, now if you were to talk to the owners of the swine, they would have had an entirely different picture of this situation. But if you're going to choose between demons inhabiting a man or a swine, they go into the swine. Amen. That's the way it is. Jesus said a man is worth many sheep, worth more than many sheep. And he's more valuable than many sparrows. So man, the chief value God has placed upon man. Not on earth, the ecologists are wrong. They're wrong. The earth's been made for us, not us for the earth. Men, beasts are made for men, not men for beasts. And Jesus just, see, this would have been highly contested by the animal rights people. I, could you imagine? Could you imagine what the animal rights people would have done here? See, animals don't have rights. It's men that have rights. Amen. And we also learn that there are regions that evil spirits do not want to leave. Maybe that's why there's some regions you have a very hard difficulty breaking through to anybody. Have you ever noticed this? There's regions like this. We're living in a region like this. That it's just hard to get through to anybody. That if you do, it's like a, it's like a miracle. It's like this man here. Here was a man out there. There was an individual that Christ got through to and that he healed and worked with and knew what Christ was and broadcasted all over. There was a man that did this. And later you'll find in the scriptures when Jesus went into this area that there were people that received him, apparently because of this man's testimony. <laughs> but it's a region that's so dominated, it's very difficult to penetrate it. Come, these kind of spirits come not out but by prayer and fasting, see? Very difficult. So you may say, well, it's because they're stubborn, it's because the people are ignorant, it's because they're disinterested, and that's true at, at a kind of a lower level, that's true. But at a higher level, it's because they're dominated by the wicked one. You learn also, Satan's hosts can't go anywhere unless the Lord lets them. Amen. They can't even go into a herd of swine unless the Lord lets them. Best they can do is just ask, that's all. There are some people that live in fear of Satan coming in their house. Live in fear of this. Unbeknowns. Might sneak in and take over. Well, this is not the case. Satan operates under the Lord. If you're under Christ Jesus, Satan's in subjection to Christ. He can't sneak in undetected if you're walking by faith. This can't happen. I understand he can stir up a ruckus sometime, but he can't dominate. He can't dominate a person who's living by faith. He may be able to stir up the waters and the storms and blow wind on them and things like this, but he can't touch that person. And you've got to really believe this, that Satan's host can't go anywhere unless the Lord lets him. And you learn from this also that the powers of darkness know their destiny. A lot of God's people don't know the destiny of Satan. To hear them talk, you know, they seem to be oblivious of where Satan's headed. But Satan's not oblivious about it. He knows it. He's concerned in his host about being tormented before the times. He knows it. So you want to be sure you know it too. You don't want to be less uh, informed on this than Satan. And also we learn from this that lengthy oppressions, this man was like this for a long time, Scripture says, lengthy oppressions can conclude instantly. <laughs> That's kind of a great thing to know, let me tell you. And if you are ever under some kind of a oppression, whatever it is, maybe it's been for a long time, long time, you wonder, will this ever end? All it takes is like one word from the king, go. It's over. He ended it with a word, go. It's over. We also learn that even the brute creation cannot welcome Satan's hosts. <laughs> These were not these were just not animals, they were unclean animals. Huh? They were unclean animals. But even the unclean animals couldn't welcome an unclean spirit. How's that, huh? Because of what God has made wasn't made for Satan. Amen. Not at all. And the the sight of a changed man 
cannot change hard hearts. Now you'd think that someone familiar with this man living among the tombs, cutting himself, shrieking out and calling at night, people probably heard him afar off, crying out in the mountains in the wilderness, coming out see this man just perfectly sane, sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed in his right mind. You might think that changed somebody, wouldn't you? Well, it didn't change them. It didn't change them at all. It scared them. The psalmist said, They that dwell in far off places are afraid of thy tokens. Mm -hmm. means when a person lives at a distance from God, if God does work something in their presence, it scares them. Mm -hmm. They're afraid of it. Just like Israel at Sinai. When God worked, they were scared. They were afraid. That's one of the penalties for living at a distance from God. Should God work in the presence of a person who's living a sloven life? They just... They're just a sloppy in the way they live toward the Lord. And let's just say God did work something in their presence. It won't bless them. It'll scare them. And actually drive them further away than they were before. And there are places where Jesus is not wanted. There are. We want to make sure it's not, it's not the place we are. And Jesus will not stay when he's asked to leave. See, those are a few things you see in this, in this account. So in view of this vast multitude of personalities around us, see, life should be lived in all sobriety. Amen. And holiness. Amen. See, what can't, you saying a person can't have any fun or enjoyment? Well, I'm not saying that. I'm just saying, so what do you want to do that for when you have a situation like this? Mm -hmm. Why would you want to live like that when you've got a situation like this? Or do you believe there is a situation like this? Or do you believe that there's a whole host of unseen personalities just waiting for an opportunity to get at you? Uh huh. It may be the Holy Spirit who's looking for an open door. It may be holy angels who's looking for a chance to minister to you. Or it may be the devil and his host who's looking for a chance to make you a madman. Mm -hmm. In a situation like that, how could you possibly justify being what we call giddy-headed or flighty? Mm -hmm. or not serious mm -hmm. or living foolishly how could you justify something in this kind of situation how could you justify living like that sobriety and all holiness and even then it'll be it'll be difficult enough well I'm looking forward to seeing this man on the other side I am seeing this man on the other side how his account has ministered to me so if you feel like you're really under the under great oppression of some sort to you it's that way think of this man think of, you're not as bad as this you're not as ran off as this man was for sure and think of this man and let it kindle hope in your heart